And now I'm going to broadcast. That just lets everyone in. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome as you join us for this session. We'll just wait for a few more moments just whilst everyone um, logs in before we start. Yeah, welcome everybody for those that have just joined us. We're going to be starting very shortly. Just give it a, one more minute or so just so that everyone who is going to attend this session can attend and make sure they catch everything from the beginning. Excellent. Uh, I make that about a minute past, so we will um, start this session and uh, then we'll take some questions at the end. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tim Messeder and I work for the KTM, uh, principally on this program, the GCRF Agri-Food Africa program. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon for the second session in this week of activities. I hope you found this morning's very interesting and useful for you. I thought it was some great presentations and uh, really enjoyed listening to the um, presentations from folks and also the um, question and answer at the end. I thought that was excellent. So thank you very much. So the way that we're going to uh, run this is we will have pre-recorded presentations from three of our, our um, panelists. Um, I just wanted to, and then at the end of that, we'll do a and A. I just wanted to go through some of the, points that you'll need to know just about the meeting as a whole um, and for the rest of this week because I think it's of relevance to you. So firstly, can I please remind you um, that if you're using Twitter, you use the, the hashtag AgriFoodAfrica, uh, then you can tweet about us that way. If you are um, going to watch anything on YouTube, please do like and subscribe because we will be sharing content on that platform over the next four or five years. So you may want to do that. There are networking events that you want to take advantage of. We've got some great companies, um, research organizations uh, and the like with us this week and they're on there. And so if you wanted to book an appointment to um, have a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting with them for a very short five to 10 minutes, then you can do that, but you do need to sign up. So please do that. Um, details for your meeting mojo, it's on our website and you can find that information there. And then lastly, just the pitching competition, let me remind you that's on Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon, your chance to present to other members about what you can offer and uh, what uh, you are looking for in any partnerships. And we had a very successful um, pitching session last week and we want to replicate that. And finally, let me just remind you of the Q&A session, uh, Q&A panel, sorry, that we're going to have on Friday. Uh, we're gonna have some, we've got some great speakers um, coming to that. Um, and uh, I think you'll really appreciate coming and you can ask live questions. So please do come to that because that one works really well if it's live. OK, this is the agenda for today. We're going to go through the Innovation Awards. Um, Debbie Tully is going to present that. She works at the KTM. She's with us now. Um, ben Bennett is going to showcase one of his Innovation Awards. Then we're going to have Catherine Miller, who's also with us and will be part of the Q&A. She's going to be talking about the Agritech Catalyst Round 10. I know that many of you have questions about that, so do stick around. And then lastly, we're going to hear from Richard Lamb, who's going to be talking about the KTPs, the Knowledge Transfer Partnerships. 
So without much ado, let's start and then we'll have some questions at the end of that. Good morning, my name is Debbie Tully and I'm a Knowledge Transfer Manager in the AgriFood team here at KTN. Today I'm going to run through some detail on the GCRF AgriFood Africa Innovation Awards. In total, and as part of the GCRF AgriFood Africa project, we have £800,000 to support up to 20 project awards. These awards are to encourage collaboration between the UK and Africa and are pump priming. So the aim being for the successful projects to go into bigger funding applications in the future. And specifically, there must be a UK research partner. So a university or a research technology organisation and an African partner, an industry partner, although some RTOs will be eligible. And importantly, the focus is to address key agri-food challenges in Africa. So the type of research these awards are encouraging are feasibility studies, industrial research studies, projects that focus on improving adoption or investment of technologies, products and services in the African agricultural sector. So round one has taken place and was announced as the GCRF Agri-Food Africa project began back in December 2019. We received 34 applications in total um, and 13 grants were awarded at £40,000 each. The time parameters have changed slightly. This is in light of the, the COVID situation with some understandable delays. However, we do anticipate that all projects will complete by the end of November 2021. And at the core, these projects align with ODA identity and look to encourage economic development and welfare in Africa. Just to elaborate a wee bit more on the scope for these awards, we were looking for projects that address challenges in primary crop and livestock production, including agriculture. Looking at projects which could improve the availability, the yield and supply of safe and nutritious foods and support challenges on the logistical side of things and importantly help add value wherever possible throughout the supply chain. And here are the 13 successful projects from round one. Um, a balanced portfolio addressing some major environmental, economical and sustainability challenges that are out there. We will shortly be hearing from one of the projects on their progress today. So the good news is we will be announcing the Innovation Awards round two later this year. The scope and eligibility will be similar to round one and currently we're looking to fund up to eight projects at £40,000 each. Within the £40,000 there will be £5,000 ring fence and that is for travel to and from Africa. I have included the link if you would like more information on the awards. Um, and an email address. If you have any questions at all that you would like to direct to us, um, please do so. We're very happy to help. Um, that's pretty much it from myself. I'm now going to introduce you to Ben Bennett from the Greenwich University, who is going to share detail on his project and progress from round one. And um, I'll, I'll leave you there. Thank you very much for your time. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Professor Ben Bennett, I'm Deputy Director of the Natural Resources Institute at the University of Greenwich and I'm the PI for the project Cassava Bags for Improved Gary Making Efficiency, CB4G. And this is our short progress report on the project um, as, uh, as far as we have got so far. So those of you that don't know what cassava is, is there anybody out there that doesn't know what cassava is? I'd be very surprised. Uh, the lady here is carrying um, a big pile of, uh, of heavy, wet cassava roots on her head. Cassava is a, is a crucial staple uh, food uh, ingredient uh, across uh, the central humid belt particularly of, uh, of Africa, but especially in Nigeria. And Gary is the fermented uh, and dried and roasted um, uh, instant um, porridge products that you see being made by the lady in the bottom left. Um, so um, this project um, aims to 
try to improve the efficiency of uh, Gary making uh, using the fresh cassava you saw in the picture on the previous page um, in, in West Africa particularly uh, where Gary is a staple uh, a staple food for hundreds of thousands of people um, and there are uh, traditionally it's made by small-scale Gary makers uh, who are almost university women and who run very small businesses like the one you've just seen um, roasting Gary they buy in fresh Gary um, and they sell uh, they buy in fresh cassava and they sell Gary um, so the challenge that they face is if you look at the picture on the right um, that is a piece of cassava root that started to have post-harvest physical deterioration so within 72 hours of pulling cassava out of the ground it's turned into this uh, rather unpleasant, mushy-like substance. The wild cassava's got very many advantages. Um, the one of its drawbacks um, is it's got a very uh, short uh, shelf life. So uh, our plan is to um, is to try to work with Gary making SMEs um, to re-engineer the supply of fresh cassava into their system uh, using um, polypropylene brag a poly propylene bag approach which, which we've been um, developing uh, for the last couple of years under a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation. This, this polypropylene bag is called Cassava Bag. We've proved that it works uh, at half ton scale and we think it can be uh, engineered to work uh, for small Gary processes to increase the shelf life of fresh cassava um, and improve the, allow them to stock cassava for up to uh, eight days. And we think this might give them a, a better return um, on the cassava they buy because you retain more starch. Um, uh, you, you can store it without deterioration, uh, but it also will allow better management of the supply chains of their business. So that's the premises behind this project. The partnership consists of um, the Natural Resources Institute, which is part of the University of Greenwich in the UK, um, and um, the University of Agriculture in Abu Yakuta, Punab uh, in southeast Nigeria, uh, and um, Benway State University, which is in the south central to western bit of Nigeria. Um, Gary producer groups, some of which we've already, already identified, some of which we need to identify, and a bag making company who's been working with us on the larger. Uh, so, where is the project? Um, the Natural Resources Institute is based at the Medway campus uh, in Kent, in the southeast of England. Um, Funab um, is in Abiyakuta, which is in the southeast, down near towards Lagos. Uh, and Benway State University is in McCurdy, all the way over here towards the southeast, so south central east, shall we say, uh, of. Uh, and, um, uh, these partners have been chosen because they sit squarely in what you might call the Gary Belt um, of southern Nigeria, where there are tens of millions of Gary consumers and hundreds of thousands of Gary, uh, Gary makers. Um, so these dark red areas on this map uh, are, are areas of concentration of both production uh, and, uh, and demand uh, for Gary and, and are two um, are two areas for developing uh, a Gary uh, network. Um, so what's the concept? Um, as, I, as I've said, Gary roots deteriorate after 72 hours, whereas the bag extends their shelf life uh, from 72 hours to eight days. Um, the, uh, the bag um, convinces the roots, if you see this lady carrying on the left-hand side, that they're still in the ground uh, by increasing the um, temptation in, 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 in the temperature and uh, humidity um, around the, the root. Um, so instead of deteriorating or the chemistry of deterioration starting, um, it stays uh, relatively dormant for eight days and then starts to uh, deteriorate. Um, so um, almost universally across uh, Africa, Gary is a cottage industry. There are a few larger companies emerging, but uh, I would say 99% of Gary is made by um, people in, like the picture you saw at the beginning, uh, individuals or groups of individuals uh, who, who uh, roast, uh, who process and roast Gary and then sell it on to um, uh, uh, Gary middlemen who take it to uh, big cities. 
So our argument is that if I'm a Gary maker and I can buy in fresh cassava in larger quantity, I'll get it at a better price and I'll be able to store it if I don't use it uh, and keep it until the next day or the day after that. And we also uh, have evidence that um, uh, by using the technology um, stored uh, cassava um, keeps its starch for longer. And if you have a higher starch level in cassava, you get more Gary per kilogram of fresh fruit. So that ratio between fresh root in and Gary out is, is very important to the bottom line. Of... So um, the deliverables in this project uh, were to, uh, were a scoping of Gary making business models in the target area um, and to develop a new, a new business model based on the smaller cassava bag uh, to set up prototype um, drawing on uh, the cassava bag for a new Gary cassava bag product and to develop a consortium around um, bringing that uh, product to the market um, along with a bag maker. And to do that, we need to start to um, build a network of uh, Gary uh, making SMEs who can trial and test the, the, the new bag technology and, and optimize it. Um, we also included in this um, uh, uh, relatively small project certain amount of uh, effort to do field trials. Uh, we wanted to gather all these people get together in a symposium to, uh, with all the different stakeholders to try to understand the various moving parts of a um, Gary Makers cassava bag um, and, and to build out of that a new uh, cassava bag network who could provide enough demand to make it interesting for the bag maker to, to start commercially so that's what it's all about. So progress to date, we signed up our partners. Um, we've been developing the research questions and the field work plans, um, but we haven't been able to have the kickoff meetings because our partners are in universities and they've got some similar challenges to ours uh, with the uh, shutdown. We're about to have the virtual kickoff meeting, uh, but we can't do the field work because it's simply not safe in Nigeria and it won't be safe in Nigeria for quite a long time. So it's. It's likely now that this field work is, is probably going to be in 2021. Um, we are trying, trying to get uh, uh, master's students to help us initiate some of the work. But of course, there's a moral challenge that if, if we can't go to the field, then you know, we shouldn't be asking uh, other colleagues in, in other countries to go to the field for us. So that's our very quick 10 minute run uh, through our progress to date. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you very much for your presentation, Debbie and Ben. Great to hear how the innovation rules are working in practice on the ground. And it's exciting to find out that they're going to be another round of funding um, at the end of the year. So we look forward to hearing more detail. We're now going to hear from Catherine Miller, who is going to be talking about the Agri Tech Capital M10. And uh, we're very much looking forward to this, I'm sure. Um, and we'd love to take questions at the end. So over to you, Catherine. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to this presentation catalyst. I'm Catherine Miller and I'm Innovation Lead for Food and Nutrition at Innovate UK. The UK Government's Agritech strategy was launched in 2013 with the aim of improving the translation of research into practical application for agriculture and related industry within the UK and overseas. This was an investment of £160 million which funded four agritech centres for innovation and the agritech catalyst. This was looking at funding translation research and it also included funding from the Department of International Development to fund projects related to the international development. The government investment in the Agritech Catalyst was a total of £70 million. The Catalyst has funded over 150 projects to date and these are industry and research collaborative projects to improve the translation of research into those practical applications. £10 million of this £70 million was from the Department for International Development and a further £10 million has also been received since then to fund further projects since 2018. DFID has funded the Agritech Catalyst since 2013 across nine competition rounds to fund projects for UK organisations to work with organisations in developing countries and since round seven the focus has been on Africa. 58 projects have been funded, 53 of those in Africa and this has delivered over £20 million worth of grant funding across 13 African countries. Round 9 projects haven't been announced yet, but will fund further 
13 projects and provide an additional £6 million worth of funding. The scope of the Agritech Catalyst is broad. Projects must show the potential to deliver impact in Africa through the uptake of agricultural and food systems technology and innovation. The scope of the Catalyst covers primary crop and livestock production and agriculture, non-food uses of crops, challenges in downstream food processing, distribution, and also storage and value addition, and improving the availability and accessibility of safe, healthy and nutritious foods. The funding for the Agritech Catalyst is Official Development Assistance, or ODA funding, and this is defined as, as funding that flows to countries and territories on the DAC list of ODA recipients. Only research directly and primary, primarily relevant to the problems of developing countries can be counted as ODA funding. And because of that, ODA eligibility is a key component of the assessment process and will be asked questions on this in your application. The applications must clearly demonstrate how you propose to work on a project and how it will benefit agriculture and food systems in Africa and how you will de deliver this benefit. Um, there can be benefits to the UK um, as secondary benefits, so for example um, for UK companies and researchers, but it has to be secondary in nature. And also any activities carried out um, within the project must be clearly to address the challenges in Africa and not for the UK market. So here are some examples of projects, the types of projects that we funded through the Agritech Catalyst so far. So of the um, 58 projects we funded through the Agritech Catalyst, the scope has been very broad and um, covering research and innovation in agriculture, food systems and nutrition. Our projects are focused on things like control of crop pests and disease, and adding value to waste and reducing food losses in the supply chain and improving food safety. We've also funded projects looking at non-food uses of crops, improving productivity for smallholder farmers and to tackle livestock disease, for example vaccination. This shows the key points around the eligibility criteria. So all projects must be collaborative. They must include a partner from an eligible African country and from the UK. Early stage and mid stage projects, as a minimum, must include one business either from the UK or from one of the African countries that are eligible. For late stage projects, they must include at least two businesses one African and one from the UK. Projects are carried out using a hub and spoke model, so you must have a UK based administrative lead who will um, claim the funds for all partners and then distribute um, as, as needed. Project work must be carried out in the UK or in the African country or in both. And as I said, you must include at least one business in the consortium for early and mid stage and two for late stage. Project costs vary depending on the stage of research. So early stage feasibility projects can be from 100,000 to 500,000 pounds in size and last from 12 to 18 months. Mid-stage industrial research can be from 250,000 to 1 million pound projects and last up to three years. And late stage experimental development projects can be 150,000 pounds up to 800,000 pounds and last up to 18 months. And projects um, should start by the 1st of April. This slide shows you the eligible African countries that can apply for funding through the Agritech Catalyst. If you are um, from a country that is not listed here, you can still take part in the Agritech Catalyst and you can still be part of a project. Um, however, um, you would still need to include a UK and an eligible African partner in your consortium. The amount of grant that you're able to claim for your project depends on the size of your business and the stage your research is at. So for early stage feasibility studies and industrial research awards, you could get up to 70% of your eligible project costs if you're a micro or small business. And the grant rates decrease um, the larger your business is. So for a large business, you would be eligible for 50% of your costs. For experimental development projects, which are nearer to market, um, you could get up to 45% of eligible costs if you are a micro or small business. And that rate goes down to 25% if you're a large business. And the grant rates are the same for UK and African businesses. Research organisations can participate in early and mid-stage projects and 
Research organisations can claim 100% of their costs for participation in these. UK universities can claim 100%, which is 80% of full economic costs, and African universities can claim 100% of their project costs. However, the total cost for your research partners must not exceed 50% of the total project costs. If your consortium contains more than one research organisation, this maximum of 50% will be shared between them. For late stage experimental development projects, research based partners cannot claim funding but can participate as subcontractors. And public sector organisations and charities can claim 100% of their project costs. I'm going to very briefly cover the application process for those of you who haven't applied for funding through this route previously, but there will be a separate webinar nearer the open date of the competition, which will go through this in a lot more detail, so I urge you to watch that um, nearer the time. We have an online service known as the Innovation Funding Service, or IFS, where you can apply for funding. You'll be asked to provide information on the application team. So who are the partners involved in the project? Um, the lead will be able to invite collaborators to add information to the application. And you'll also be able to invite colleagues from your own organisation to help you complete it. You'll be asked application details, for example, the research category you're applying for, innovation area, and the title and the length of your project. You'll be asked to provide a short summary um, and also provide a public description and this is published um, if you are successful and the scope of the project and um, you need to explain how your project aligns with the scope of the competition and if it's not in line with the competition um, scope then your project will not be assessed you will then be asked 11 questions about your project and this covers um, a range of areas including the business opportunity and um, what project results you'd expect to see, and technical approach and the innovation, and any risks that you foresee, and the project team, and so, some other areas. And two main areas of focus are around official development assistance and the International Development Act, so asking you how your project fits with both of these. As a summary, this just gives you the key information for the competition. So two to three million pounds is likely to be available across these three strands, early, mid and late stage. The competition is due to open on the 20th of July 2020 and close on the 21st of October 2020. Projects should start by the 1st of April in 2021. We're also holding three collaboration webinars and the provisional date for these is the 9th of July this year. And these are looking at different themes. So they are looking at crop, livestock and food systems and nutrition. So if you're interested in a project in one of those particular themes, you can join the webinar, find out a little bit more information and hear from a case study and also have um, targeted networking with others who are interested in the same theme. And the link on here just gives you the link to the Innovate UK competition page where the full information will be published at the end of June. If you have any queries and um, we have a support line and um, both phone number and an email address. I'd urge you as well to contact my transfer network on any specific questions around partnering and collaboration or putting in your application and also have a look at the Innovate UK website. Thank you very much. I hope that has provided you with the aggregate catalyst. There will also be a competition briefing nearer the time, which again will go into very um, high levels of detail around the application process. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Catherine, for your presentation. Uh, great to hear about the Agritech Catalyst 10. I'm sure there'll be many people that are keen to find out a bit more about it and are already thinking about ideas to apply for it. Uh, we are now going to hand over to uh, Richard Lamb, who's also from Innovate UK, and will be letting us know a little bit about the knowledge transfer partnerships which are also running within this programme. So over to you, Richard. Hello there, my name's Richard Lamb. I'm the KTP Programme Manager at Innovate UK. I've been asked to talk today about the Africa Agri-Food KTP, um, which we are delivering in conjunction with our colleagues in the KTM and the uh, Agri team at Innovate. So our programme is uh, funded through um, Global Challenges Research Fund 
and the money that we have for KTP is part of a much wider programme um, of activity that is being run um, through innovation, focusing on agri-food in Africa. KTPs have been around for a long time. We've been running it for the programme for 45 years here in the UK. And KTPs are a partnership between businesses with uh, an idea and they want to grow, but they don't know how to do it. Um, our universities and research organisations partner with those businesses to come up with a plan, an idea of how you can solve this challenge that the business is facing, and we support that um, through our knowledge transfer advisors who are based at the KTM. Together, the university, the business, and our knowledge transfer advisors proposal, which is submitted to Innovate, and if funded, uh, the university then employs an associate, a graduate, who is skilled in the area uh, that the business needs, and they act as the conduit that pulls the information from the university into the business and helps the business embed that knowledge and learn. So they're not just um, learning, uh, they're not just given a fish, as it were, they're taught how to fish. Um, one of the unique features of KTP is that the university employs the associate, but they spend most, if not all, of their time in the business. In Africa, we're going to try and replicate the model. Um, we want to um, reflect the local nature of the challenges that are faced um, in our um, target countries. Um, so what we are doing is we are bringing together a UK university with an a in-country university in one of our target areas um, and they are partnering with a business with a challenge. Again, if successful, if funding is approved, the university in the host country will employ the graduate and they will spend most of their time in the business. We have uh, knowledge transfer advisors that are helping develop this process with the UK universities and we are using another initiative that is happening within the KTM to embed knowledge transfer advisors in each of our target countries. So our target, our pilot countries are Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya and South Africa. So if you are a business or a university or research organisation in any of those countries and the business has a challenge and you think you can help them, if you partner with a UK university, um, or indeed if you're a UK university and you have contacts in any of those countries, we'd like to hear from you and we'll help you put a project plan together. We have about £6 million pounds over four years to support about 24 projects, and we have the first applications in, and we're hoping that they will start at the end of this year. Of course, uh, a little something has uh, caused our planned timelines to uh, go a little bit awry, but the applications are in, and that's a good thing. So um, for a 24-month project, we're anticipating a budget of £250,000, which will be split 50-50 between the UK and the African University partners. Um, we are looking to uh, enhance the, the UK, uh, sorry, the, the KTP model, and enhancing the reach and reputation of our organisations, which is one of the reasons we're doing this. But we are using um, the uh, new funding that has come on, online to help provide the African KTN programme to piggyback um, the KTPs on lots of acronyms that use KT, I'm afraid, in this presentation. But because we will have uh, a support network uh, across Africa through the African KTN, um, we feel able to help, uh, we feel able to deliver the uh, KTP programme. And we can build on the support and knowledge that we have from the KTAs, the non transfer advisors here in the UK, and the found for similar group of people um, in each of the countries that we are going to be working So, the scope of your project um, can be quite wide ranging, it's a whole group of um, food producing type projects that you can look at. There's lots more information available online if you look at that web link at the top. Um, that gives you a lot more uh, information about the scope, but the general terms are there. I won't read out the full list, but basically if you're growing it, harvesting it, protecting it, 
processing it or shipping it, there's probably a project there for you. What we're not looking to fund at the moment is anything to do with forestry or the growth and distribution of ornamental plants, wild capture fisheries, anything to do with horses or crops for energy production. If you think you've got a project, what we'd like you to do is have a chat with one of the knowledge transfer advisors here in the UK, and I'm going to put their contact details up in a moment, and they'll send a check what you're thinking of. Uh, and then if we think that's a good idea, we'll go forward and ask you to fill in a fact find form where you flesh your idea out in a bit more detail before going on to the full submission. So this is the funding profile, £125,000 for the UK knowledge base partner. Obviously, the fact pays for the same things here in the UK, essentially as it does in, in Africa. Um, there's a really healthy travel and subsistence budget. We want to make sure that the knowledge flows both ways. Um, obviously, we're paying for the academic time and we're paying for the university to support the, um, the, the project and it's the UK university that acts as the um, pivot point, if you like, within the knowledge exchange process. In the African university, the additional thing is that they will employ the, uh, they, they, they will employ the uh, associate, and that's part of their um, budgets. And, but essentially, there is enough, should be enough money there to run a really good project and a really well structured project. The business doesn't need to contribute at all other than in kind uh, and host the associate and make sure that they, the associate gets the commercial exposure and the business immersion that is required as part of the project. So this is the submission process. You have an idea, you talk to the KTAs, they go yes, do a fact find form, you submit that to um, the African country lead, details in a moment. They say, okay, that will make sense. Prepare a full proposal. You work with the lead again to develop that and, and you submit that into any of the current KTP competitions, identifying it as an African agriculture KTP. It goes through the normal KTP review process. It is judged alongside every other KTP because it has to meet uh, the same criteria in terms of knowledge exchange and knowledge transfer that we would expect of any project. Hopefully, fingers crossed, it's all approved. We normally do that approval process within about eight weeks of the competition closing, so you're not kept hanging around for a long time. Um, and once that decision has been made, hopefully get the funding and a grant offer letter will be approved, and at that point, the project can officially start. All the way through this will be supported by knowledge transfer advisors in the UK, and in time, the African-based uh, in-country advisors, who will be there to support and monitor and mentor the projects as they grow and evolve. So the delivery model is, is this, um, that the UK University is a fund holder and fund allocator, and the African University delivers the tactical, academic, scientific and technical knowledge and employs the associate and the African business hosts the associate and provides the challenge that everyone is working on. So this is the uh, Knowledge Transfer Network team here in the UK. Um, so Ian Blakemore and Jerry O'Hagan who are leading on South Africa, Ken Frame who's leading on Nigeria, Joel Ferguson who's looking after Kenya, John Clayton, who is looking after Ghana, and we've also included Niju here, who is um, KTN Head of International Development and leading the development of KTN in Africa. Now that's very much a whistle-stop tour of African agriculture KTPs. If you want, and want to know any more, um, contact one of these people on the screen now. Um, but for now, my time is up, so thank you very much for listening, and I'll be around for the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for those uh, questions. Uh, wonderful to, to hear um, that from everybody. Uh, there you are. Hello again. Uh, we're now going to 
go over to the question and answer session um, part of this uh, session. And uh, we've got quite a few questions coming in, which is fantastic. So we'll go through those. Um, just bear with me a moment. Let's go to Catherine first, I think. Um, actually, just to mention, before we do that, just a bit of housekeeping. So uh, if you're after the slides for this presentation, this is going to be uploaded onto YouTube. So you can watch this back at your leisure. So that'll answer that particular um, question. If you've got any questions, do please type them into the Q&A session and we will run till about three o'clock. Um, so we should give us some time to go through some questions. Right, so let's go to um, uh, Catherine first. So it's one from Sadiq Dasbiswas. Sorry if I've got that wrong in the name. Uh, it says, hi, we're a UK based micro SME interested to participate. Can a UK SME participate and two, is UK university participation mandatory? Thanks, Catherine. So for the Agritech Catalyst, um, if you are a UK SME, um, then yes, um, you can take part in the Agritech Catalyst. So you can um, take part and lead in the early and mid-stage projects and in the late stage as well. Um, UK, um, UK research organisations can take part in early and mid-stage but as part of late stage projects, they can only take part as subcontractors. So um, short answer, um, yes, you can definitely take part um, as a UK micro SME. And um, if you have a look on the website for Agritech Catalyst round nine, you can see the eligibility criteria, um, which will be the same for round 10. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, thanks for that, Catherine. Um, Another one from Patrick. Catherine, I'm staying with you just for now. Patrick Guyas asking, if we've applied twice under previous Agritech catalysts and have not been successful, can we apply again? And I think perhaps the answer to this um, in terms of feedback might be worth speaking to Jane. I might bring her in on this one at the end, perhaps, Catherine, if you want to take the beginning bit. Yeah, um, so for the Agritech Catalyst, um, you can reapply with the same project once, um, but then you'd need to substantially change your project to submit it again. So you can't keep submitting the same project over and over. You can only do that once. Um, so it doesn't stop you as an organisation submitting um, another proposal. Um, it doesn't stop you doing that at all. Um, but um, if it's the same project, then, then you need to think of a, a different idea or, or change it in a substantial way. Um, but, but often um, projects will apply and actually get the feedback from their first application process and then improve their, um, improve their application and then submit it into the following round and, and can then be um, get a higher um, percentage in the assessment. So you can do that once, but no more than once. Thank you, Catherine. Jane, did you care to comment on how we can improve applications? Well, yes, uh, Tim, I, in addition to Catherine's comments there, it's also true that um, if you've not already help, asked for help from the KTN, that we as a service will actually help you look at your application and, and almost do a pre-judging in a way and help you to make sure that you do answer the questions properly, which is, which is the main reason that people don't score as well as they, they might for a given project. Um, of course, we can't guarantee that we're going to get you through past the finishing line, but we can try and help you to achieve the best that you can for your project in a very competitive environment. That's great. Thank you, Jane. Um, a question here for Richard, um, who's also on the line, just around KTPs. And this one comes in from Stuart. He's saying, RE KTPs, will research organisations beside universities be allowed? I, I work with an agricultural research institute run by the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, yes, if they're registered as a RTO or something similar, then they would be eligible to participate, but they do need to uh, register with KTP um, before uh, they get too far down the line. It's a relatively straightforward process, but we need to know every organisation participating is bought into the uh, ideals and principles of the KTP programme. That's great. Thank you, Richard. And I'll stay with you just for one from Hitesh Patel um, asking, for the KTP, is a project looking at developing the application of the food waste, i.e. biodegradable materials, is that in scope? Yeah, I've just been looking at the, uh, the, the scope document, the links in the presentation, and non-food uses of crops is, um, is one of the areas that we 
that is in scope. So um, a provisional yes, but obviously we'd like to know in a bit more detail before a, giving you a definite yes or a no. Thank you, Richard. Uh, one for Catherine here. This is from Uluwesi Shorinola. Could the Agritech Catalyst application also include non-UK and non-African partners? Yes, it can. So you can have an application that includes partners from other countries, um, but you must um, have the sort of minimum number of organisations involved in the consortium. So you have to have a UK eligible partner and you have to have um, an African eligible partner. But then you could also have um, partners from other countries as well. Thanks, Catherine. And uh, one for Debbie around the um, Innovation Awards and perhaps Jane may want to help because they're quite specific, these ones. Um, so two questions. Uh, one from Tristan asking, are the Innovation Awards available to all the target countries? And then there was another one, which I'm so, apologies, I can't find the person who asked that, but asking for when, when they're going to be announced, basically, or when they're open the next round. Okie dokie. Um, so we haven't got a definite date. It's definitely going to be this year. Um, we are planning on hopefully launching round two late summer. So um, fingers crossed when we do our next activity in, in July, uh, we might be able to announce something then. But it, it, will be, it will be in the next few months. So it's definitely coming. Um, to Tristan's question about the eligible countries. It's the same as the list that, that Catherine showed us earlier on for uh, the, the ODA countries. So exactly the same for the innovation voucher. They are applicable. Excellent. That's great. Thanks. Thanks for that, Debbie. Um, and just a quick question there about how we as a KTN help review proposals. Um, if you contact us, um, we can talk that through um, with you. So just do that if you would. Um, Someone's asking, uh, Richard, this is for you. Um, to be more specific, is there a limit to the number of ideas, concepts submissible for KTP? Uh, I've just been typing an answer to that one. Um, no, no, there's no limit, but um, f first thing is to check your ideas are in scope. So go to that uh, web link that uh, was posted in, in my presentation. Um, but also remember that when you're applying, it takes an awful lot of time for you to put the information down into the application and create a, uh, a, a good application. All of Innovate's competitions are competitive. So you have to put in you know, your best effort to get the best chance of success. So my best advice is always to find a good idea and develop that rather than um, work on multiple fronts and, and hope that one of them um, you know, it is good enough. Yeah, that's some great um, feedback there, Richard. Thank you. And I wonder if you'd pick up this other one, because I think it's come up a couple of times just about basically, is this going to be extended to other African countries or can you clear up, just be crystal clear on that if possible? Yeah. So, so at the moment, no. Um, KTP relies on having a, a support network and where we've tried it in other countries and we haven't had that support network, the, the projects haven't been terribly successful. So we're piggybacking on another um, award that the KTN have got, which is setting up offices in Africa, African countries and their first countries are the four that we're going into. So um, that's why we've chosen those countries. So um, off the top of my head, as Afri um, Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, and South Africa. Um, if we were able to get some more money and we were able to uh, extend uh, our, our projects in KTP and that the support network, then yes, we would, we would love to do that. But at the moment, there's no plans and no money to do that. But who Thanks, Richard. My brain. No, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, Catherine, would, would you mind? Ian Dawson. Uh, could you explain the key differences between an early stage feasibility agritech catalyst project and an innovation award collaborative pump priming project? Yes, so um, the early stage project, uh, early stage feasibility projects through the catalyst are bigger projects than the innovation awards. So they are projects from 100,000 up to 500,000 pounds, um, lasting between 12 and 18 months. Um, the innovation awards are really um, they're sort of smaller pump priming awards that you might do before you maybe went on to 
do a bigger project. So they are £40,000 awards and they are sort of a partnership between a UK academic and um, an African um, organisation. Whereas for the early stage feasibility projects, you can have more than the two partners. Um, you can also have UK industry that can claim funding. Um, so it depends sort of on the size and scope really of, of the and scale of the project that you're looking to do. But if you have a particular idea, um, it might be worth dropping us um, just a short paragraph and we can sort of advise which is best for you to go for. Thanks, Catherine. That's um, helpful to, to know. Um, another question here just about for Catherine, just when, when are the results for the Catalyst applications are going to be announced? So round nine um, have been, the, the projects have been told that they've been successful, um, but the results haven't been published quite yet. Um, they should be, I would have thought, published in the next month or so. Um, those projects are in the setup phase. Um, you can find the Agritech Catalyst eight projects online. I can, I'll post the link in the chat so you can look at um, those projects and that gives summaries of, of the sorts of things that we've been funding. Uh, excellent, that's, that's really helpful, thank you. Uh, let me just get, uh, if you, and I'm not, I'm not sure of that one. Uh, so I presume this is to do with the Agritech Catalyst round 10, it doesn't indicate, but uh, maybe we could answer that for, uh, we could answer that for the Innovation Awards and the Agritech. So I'll go to Debbie first. Would subsistence agriculture systems be eligible, i.e. Pastoral, pastoralism food systems? I, I did see that question, so I'm assuming that that's to do with livestock in which case yes it would be applicable for the innovation vouchers thank you and uh, catalyst. catalyst as well yeah that would be in scope fantastic um if you are uh, catherine over staying with you if you are a current innovate uk grantee are you allowed to apply for the agritech catalyst i presume yes you can so um even if you've got another project with innovate um you can apply for funding through this route as well okay um, Debbie, could you answer one about uh, uh, what period of time after when the project should commence uh, in terms of innovation was? So, just could, could you tell us sort of the time scales that we're looking for? Um, yes, yeah, so so we are looking for a kind of year from announcing the awards. We are looking for them to be completed within the year, um, but we are looking. We're aiming for November twenty twenty one for completion of, of all the awards. Okay, that's fantastic. Um, and a couple more questions. So, uh, so this one's for Catherine. Apologies, for those who are asking the questions, I'm not 100% sure if it's for the Agritech Catalyst or the Innovation Awards. Um, but I'm presuming it's the Innovation Awards, uh, sorry, the Agritech Catalyst Awards. Uh, if not, then do correct us and we'll get the answer to those. So this is from uh, Taita. I'm not gonna pronounce your surname because I'm sure I get that wrong. Do we get detailed feedback on projects that fail to get funding, Catherine? Yes, um, so you will um, get feedback, you get um, a summary of the feedback um, on each of the questions that you submitted. So yes, you, you get detailed feedback um, when you're um, shortly after you're notified whether you've been successful or not. So you do receive that. Mm -hmm. um, again, one asking from Sudip, um, asking about the technology ready level. If they're at level three going to four, would early stage be right for them, Catherine? Yes, so that's the sort of TRLs that um, would be considered sort of the early stage feasibility studies. So yes, that's the sort of um, thing we'd be looking for. Okay, uh, just a question here say, asking about the unfunded part, um, i.e. is the funding conditional on the private percentage being funded first or in parallel, or how is the full funding addressed? Um, um, well so I, I can answer that from KTP because in KTP it's fully funded. So there, there's no additional funding required within the KTP project. Um, and for the Agritech Catalyst, um, so I'm not entirely clear on sort of the question, but I'll just sort of summarise the, the funding. So if you, um, if you apply for funding, a certain percentage um, you can actually claim. So, um, for example, if you're an SME, um, working on an early stage or mid stage project, you can claim 70% of the funding. So you would need to be able to match fund the remaining 30% of your portion of, of that work. Um, hopefully that sort of helps, but if 
there's another question, send it in or um, we can help out. No, that's, that's, that's fine. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I think we're coming, wrap it, we're going to wrap up very shortly. So if you did have another question and you're somebody watching, um, do please type that in because um, we are rapidly running out of time. We'll see what we can do. Um, so last question at the moment um, for Richard. Uh, thanks for the advice provided earlier, Richard. So compliment to you. Well done. That's, uh, that's nice. Nice to see. Thanks. Thanks, uh, people that are. are Thank working. you. Thank you for um, listening. <laughs> and another one. Who eventually owns the IP coming out of a KTP engagement? Okay, t typically it's shared between the universities and the businesses that participate. We ask that uh, IP agreement is drawn up before the project starts, so it's clear right from the outset. Excellent. Well. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I can't see any. Oh, I, I, okay. We've got one more. Let, let's see if I can. This is about match funding, basically. But how, they want to know how it's working in practice. I think so. Some of the maybe perhaps Catherine could explain a bit about that. Um, we'll keep this as the last question, I think. So, do we have to provide match funding first and then claim, or is it in parallel? No. So you don't have to provide the funding up front. Um, but if, for example, you had, um, I don't know, you, you ordered some materials or you had an invoice for, say, £1,000, you would then only be able to claim £700 back. So you need to be able to have that remaining £300 to pay for that, that portion of the project, if that makes sense. So, so you don't have to send us funding or anything like that, but you need to have the funds there to be able to support the project. And there will be financial checks to make sure that you can do that before the funding is awarded. That's great. Thank you very much for that. That makes uh, a lot more sense, I think. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody, for um, staying with us and uh, listening to the presentations, for being very engaged with the questions. I like to try and rattle through them just so that we can get as many as possible. So hopefully we didn't lose you along the way. A bit of a quick fire exercise keeps our panellists on the toes as well, which is always great. So um, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow morning um, for our session. That will be uh, streaming from uh, 10 a.m. So do join, it, join us for that. We look forward to it. And don't forget, if you want to pitch, uh, the pitch competition will be shutting tomorrow. So you need to get a, a wriggle on and I'm sure you'll have time to do that if you wish. We've also got a panel session at the end of the week on a Friday, so please don't forget to attend live so we can have another great session on, on with some questions and I look very much forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. So thanks very much everybody and uh, we'll see you shortly. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.